Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2018 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Jill Randolph, and I'm a first-year MBA student at MIT Sloan. And it is my pleasure to present our panel, Digital Disruption Strategies to Reach the Modern Fan. Um, these are our panelists, starting with Greg Economo, Chief Commercial Officer and Head of Sports at Ticketmaster. Steve McArdle, Chief Administrative Officer and EVP at the NHL. Next is Fong Lee, who is the CFO at MicroStrategy. We have Carly Ursay gordon Vice Chair and Owner of the Indianapolis Colts. And our moderator is Marie Donahue, who is a longtime senior executive in sports media and content. And most recently, an EVP of global business and content strategy at ESPN. Our con uh, panel will last about 40 minutes with five minutes of Q&A at the end. If you would like to submit a question, please do so using Twitter and the hashtag digital disruption. And with that, I'll hand it over to Marie. Thanks, Jill. Um, hello, and thanks for joining us. I know everyone's excited about uh, Obama, so I'm glad you guys uh, stopped by here first. Um, so as we're all witnessing, even at this conference, um, there seems to be a fairly insatiable appetite for sports. Um, and with that, demand for access to athletes and teams has reached unprecedented levels. Um, the good news is that digital advancements have actually brought fans closer than ever to teams and athletes they follow, um, and organizations have more touch points than ever with consumers and fans. Um, so today we have four innovative, very innovative leaders focused on this very ecosystem. And they will share with us how their organizations are innovating to enhance their operations, the fan experience, investments they need to be successful, and how they see the space changing uh, in the coming years. Thank you, guys. Thank you. It's good to warm up Obama. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. It's much better, than, much better than going after him. Yeah, that's right. There's um, going to be nobody here with 15 minutes to go. They're going to all be like getting online. So. <laughs> Pressure will be off then. Exactly. Um, so it seems like every business these days is espousing a, quote, digital first approach, um, whether it be in terms of content, touch points with consumers, or even sometimes just their overall organizations. Um, so this is for all of you to jump in um, however, in whatever order you'd like. Um, can you explain a little bit what the digital first approach means to you? And if you could talk a little bit about how you execute both within your organization, which can sometimes be the toughest, um, and also externally with respect, to, with respect to fans or consumers. Go that way. Go that way. Great, I'll go first. <laughs> um, you know, I think for us at Ticketmaster, it's understanding consumer behavior, number one, right? It's the way people are living their lives these days. So, the question becomes how do we create that uh, facility or ability for them to um, you know, use our platform to get what they want, to get the content they want. So when you think about us, we're, we're actually two, a company with two different missions. One is we're a marketplace that sells tickets ourselves and we compete with other marketplaces in that vein. Therefore, to be digitally forward and be thinking about how to do that more effectively and better and have a better user experience is preeminent this day and age. On the other side, we're a software business, so we install software at hundreds and hundreds of different uh, properties, and in this case, sports teams. And then the charge becomes, well, how, how do we not only be digital first with our solutions, our, our product services, platforms, et cetera, it's how can we be prescriptive and help our clients see how to be um, that forward thinking and that digital first thinking so that we maximize that capability? Because at the end of the day, it's the way people are living. You know, they're living with their phone and they're living, you know, and we're seeing amazing adoption and adaption to mobile and digital and it's just following that trend and trying to get out in front of it. So it's interesting, Greg, you actually have to be an advocate to your customers. Yeah, and, and on the forward. software side of the business for sure. And you know, we we fought really hard this year and Kurt Schwarzkopf's out here. He runs our NBA and NHL segment and Clay Luters is our EVP of sports and leans into the NFL and we worked really hard to try to get our teams to go all digital, to, to all digital ticketing, um, which 
you know, is a, is a huge f education, client education to go out and prove, hey, this is, this is the future, this is the way to go, go now, start, you know, taking advantage of the, the benefits that it's going to provide, like fan identity, which I'll talk a lot about, I'm sure, on this panel. But yeah, on that side of the business, there's a lot of education to do, client education to do, or at least client discussion to do, so that, um, you know, that, that we're all um, kind of singing off the same sheet of music for sure. Yeah, and I think a good example of that, we had our all-star game in Tampa three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and over 85% of the people who came into the building for the all-star game on Saturday night and on Sunday used a digital ticket through the SDKs that Ticketmaster provides with us. So we're seeing very, very rapid evolution and adoption, even though we still have clubs and we still have fans who want to send those traditional packages of tickets for souvenir purposes or, or just because it's a comfort thing to hand the ticket over. Uh, when you go through the gate, we're, you know, we're seeing extremely rapid adoption across the board of, of digital ticketing. Yeah, I didn't even think we thought it would be that rapid. Yeah. You know, we started going digital and we thought, you know, and t our teams thought, oh my goodness, like, we're going to not have paper? Like, how's that going to work? Our, our traditional fans are, you know, they're used to having paper. How are we going to do it? You know, we're seeing, like, these, you know, phenomenal stats across the board, 85% college football playoff championship game was 77, 78% digital tickets. Um, the U.S. Open was probably 70% of, of digital tickets. So, you know, if, if my 13-year-old can buy his Frappuccino at Starbucks by tapping his iPhone, I mean, I think my dad can figure out how to do the same thing, and that's happened really rapidly, so. Yeah, a lot of um, food, quick, quick service food places in New York don't even take cash. Right. Yeah. Which can be <laughs> disruptive for some people. I've gotten used to it. Yeah, we're, at the NHL, we're a content business. I mean, we're, we're, we, it starts with the game on the ice, and then everything that comes off of the ice is, is content in some way, shape, or form. And so for us, um, internally, it's understanding, A, the importance of speed to market, because now that everything has gone digital, there's a, the, the customers expect it now, and they expect it right, and they expect it to work. And so we spend a lot of time looking at trends in terms of how fast are we getting content out there, how much is that content being used, the investments that we have to make internally in analytics, both resources, people, and infrastructure to help us understand and track how fans are consuming our data, that, that's probably been the most surprising transformation on our end, is just how much effort it takes to understand what people are using and then how you can course correct quickly to, to serve up that content as quickly and, and in the best form possible. I, on your point, I think, am I good on the mic? I think that um, the key is you have to also have the infrastructure set up. I think that's one of the things with with where um, the Colts are being in the Midwest. Um, we were surprised to discover that you know more than half of the people in our building still buy their concessions with cash, um, which I was kind of blown away by. Um, but if, when we think about, it's not just digital first. I think we still have in the NFL a huge core of fans that are, you know, they're over 35 and, you know, we have people that like to come to our office and pick up their tickets in person and take their booklet home. I mean, it's, I mean, it's going away, but I think it's not just digital first. It's kind of the exciting thing about digital is it's how you want it. If you want it paper, you can have paper. If you want it digital, you can have it digital. If you want to print it out and send your tickets to your friends and not pay a fee, I think it's just the options that I like about it. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, what, what, what I found is, uh, so, so at MicroStrategy, we serve a lot of different industries, both providing software and uh, services to help companies go through their digital transformation. But uh, most of the folks we talk to, so I saw the stat the other day that says 75% of Fortune 2000 companies believe if they don't come up with a digital transformation strategy and implement it in the next two years, they'll be behind their competition. So everybody comes to us and says, oh, we need a digital transformation strategy. You know, can we buy your, can we buy your software and, and put in a data warehouse and we're set? And, and we always say, it's not a technology solution, it's also a lot to do with technique, right? You know, do you have the right people in the organization to be a really digitally transformative company? Or do you have the customers who are ready to go along uh, with the digital transformation? Right? It's not just about putting in a data warehouse. It's not about just putting in an analytics platform. It's not about just hiring a chief data officer. So, you know, there's all these point solutions. 
and companies are all scrambling to not get taken over by Amazon, and they're all confused of what to do. And we tell everybody, hey, hold on, take a step back and figure out who your customers are, who you're trying to serve, what is the business problem you're trying to solve. Get away from this buzzword digital transformation and what are you really trying to do? And then talk about the software, and then talk about the people you need to hire. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of companies are just rushing into this digital transformation without any strategy, hoping to catch up and if you go that way, if you ignore the fact that your customers can't, don't pay by a credit card, if you ignore these things, you'll, you'll go the wrong, wrong direction. And, and we've practiced that on ourselves, too. And it sounds like a lot of the folks up here are practicing it also. You guys have touched on it a little, but I wanted to ask specifically, are there any dangers or threats to your business and your operations posed by digital? I mean, whether it be marketing mistakes, uh, Honestly, consumers or fans thinking it's a little creepy, you know so much about them. Like, what are some of the challenges or, or hazards to be avoided? I mean, I think the most obvious, it, it has to work, and that's a blessing and a curse. When, when, when you've got 85% of the fans come into a building with a digital ticket and the Wi Fi is down or some part of the scanner system goes down, it's, it's chaos. And that bad leads, it's me. a bad day for all of us. Yeah. And, and that's everything from ticketing to streaming. I mean, we, we, we'll talk about OTT later, but you know, we've been, uh, all the leagues have uh, an OTT platform that we've been doing ourselves for, for many, many years. And the complicated handshakes from capturing the content in the arena, encoding it, sending it over an MPLS network, decoding it, getting it to a CDN, getting it to your phone, making sure the app that you're consuming it on your phone actually works. When that handshake or that system goes down, you hear it loud and clear on the other side of digital, which is social. And the, the, the response is immediate, it's loud, it's a great way to QC or, or quality control what's happening with your content, because the second it breaks, you hear about it, but then you better fix it quickly, because that then just snowballs and, and, and builds upon itself. So you know, it sounds very basic, but it's extremely complicated, making sure you're picking the right partners, making sure your buy versus build decision is right, because if you overextend yourself and you get into an area of that ecosystem where you're not comfortable and your people are not comfortable, things fall apart pretty quickly. So that sort of uh, process of determining where you stop, where your partners pick up, and then making sure it all works is, is it's important and it's yeah, dangerous. It's, it's, it's part tech infra and infrastructure. I mean, obviously there's cybersecurity issues. The more we're digital, the more we have to be aware of cybersecurity. I think, you know, from a marketer standpoint, I think it's important not to forget the humanity in it all, right? And so, like, how, how, do, we, how do we, you know, in our business, right? We're owned by Live Nation. We serve the, 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 the music industry and the sports industry. H how do we always remember that we live for live, right? That we're in it for the fan and that whether we're using digital or traditional, that, that we have the right narrative and we have the right approach and we're, and we're listening. And uh, you know, and we're serving a value proposition that they want to that, that they want to consume, whether it's easier to consume on digital or not. Like that, the, the key is it's what they want. So I think that's part of it. We sometimes can get lost in the hullabaloo of you know all the digital and, and things and infrastructure and technology. And it's at some point people are still buying stuff, and we have to sell them what they want. And you've also raised the expectations. I mean, people expect things instantly and expect perfect service, and you kind of promised that. So it's tough when that, that doesn't deliver. One of the things I was going to add to you with, with the content piece um, and with social, the way, you think, the way we think about digital, I think, is the way our, you know, it's allowing us to you know, really serve our customers better and our fans better to have more options. But then you know, on the brand facing side, the questions we ask is with social, as an example, you know, our customers, if we don't speak and we don't have a voice that stays consistent, you know, then our customers will just speak and they will say who we are. And it doesn't matter if we say, no, that's not who we are, it just, continues to proliferate in a certain way. And I think that's one of the things that we've been trying to navigate. And I know, you know on the league level is how, how do we use our voice on social? What do we use it for? How do we connect there as opposed to you know, live game? You know, what does that mean? I think there's more of a preservation for people still want the, I mean, with ESPN, they want the high quality you know, screen views, whereas you know, social is more connecting. 
I think the, uh, the provocative thought, though, is, is if, if you're not playing the game and you're getting passed by everybody else, that's the biggest risk, is you become irrelevant. And uh, you know, we saw yesterday Snapchat lost a billion and a half in valuation because of you know people you know weren't happy with it with, with their new release and the one CEO person, I think. one person uh, that's that, allegedly allegedly but you know you know and, and the CEO's response was a little bit irreverent but he said well you know if we didn't tr keep trying new things we wouldn't be a twenty billion dollar company to have a billion and a half to lose to begin with and and, and so. I, I battle with legal departments of our customers all the time who say you can't provide this information. You can't, especially in Europe, right, in Germany, you can't, you can't move this information between borders. And I say, well, what do you want to do? Do you want your, do you want your company to just sit still for the next two years? Is that what you're going to do? Because you know, if you try to get all the risk out of an organization, all of a sudden you really aren't really doing anything that's transformative. So it, you have to be careful, absolutely, and you have to you know, try new things. But I've seen companies just stall trying to get all the risk out of the organization. Uh, so now we'll go to money for a little while, which is always interesting. Um, so as we all know, the data certainly shows that there's a growing shift in consumer preference um, for digital media, especially prefer, um, as compared to traditional media. And a lot of those dollars are following. I have some numbers. The ad dollars, uh, digital ad spending reached $209 billion worldwide last year. That's 41% of the market, um, while TV was at 35% of the market, which is pretty staggering that digital overall, obviously different search and things like that, but has um, taken over traditional media. Um, so have you guys, I know you're not all heavily involved with ad sales, but obviously partnership, partnerships, sponsorships, you're a marketer. Um, have you seen this trend? Has is, is it changed your day-to-day -day business? And, and how, how, has anything surprised you as you navigate the shifting ad dollars, whether it be an advertiser or as a content owner? Yeah, you see the ad dollars have shifted. That's been going on for a number of years, and it's probably going to continue to go on. And, and at Ticketmaster, we, I would venture that vast, vast majority of our marketing spend or advertising spend is digital. Like it's, it doesn't make sense for us to scale our business by buying traditional media, right? So the other half of the equation is we have a lot of sponsorship relationships with our partners, and so how do we actually acquire the assets in those deals to, to do more and better in the digital space? So yes, that's definitely happening um, to a large degree. On our side in the ticket selling game, you know, we're seeing that massive shift happening. I mean, I think six, we had a billion visits to our site last year, and 60% of those were on mobile devices, um, which is astonishing that, you know, you're, you know this 40-year-old company, 42-year-old company is now, you know, shifting like that. Four, I think 40% of our sales happened uh, on a mobile device. So we're seeing this kind of mind shift, and, it, you know, it's where, and obviously that's where the ad dollars go, right? If you have that many people who are transacting on a platform, that's where the ad dollars are going to go. So it's, pay, you know, read the tea leaves and figure out how to develop the, you know, the, the solutions that are going to make sense for consumers and for advertisers. Yeah, it's interesting. We have the same numbers. So 60% of the visits to the NHL digital platforms are all through a mobile device now. It's shifted significantly away from, from traditional desktop, so we're, we're seeing the same trends. In terms of sponsorship dollars, you know, it, it, it's a given now that any sort of sponsorship integration, an official league partner has to have an innovative digital component or sponsors are just not interested any longer. The, the standard buttons and banners, it's, that's, that's not it anymore. It is what content can you serve up to me exclusively, and then how can you present it to your fans in an innovative way? And that's the starting point of, of almost every conversation these days. So yeah, we just wrapped up our 100th anniversary. The NHL turned 100 in, in 2017. And the sponsor interest that we had in the content that we created from our 100 years of history, and then the way we served that up through unique microsites or unique activations digitally was, was staggering. And it was because we offered something, we, we went through a process of of digitizing 100 years of game stats. We've, we've never done that before. We have game sheets going back to our first game played in 1917. Digitized all of it, and then presented it in a way where fans can actually go back and search through specific games from the 20s, 30s, 40s, look at specific player stat sheets from those games, from important games in our history. But then we, we're the only ones who had that. We're, we, it was sitting in a room in Toronto collecting mold for many, many years until we went through a seven-year process to digitize it all and make sure it was all correct and, and serve it up. 
But then sponsors find that to be extremely attractive. It's something that no one else can offer up. It's something that they can get behind, and it's something they can work with us to shape and provide in ways that fans can interact with and, and promotes their brand in an integrated way, not an in-your-face way. And that's how we're seeing our sponsorship dollars shift. It's got to be innovative content and, and unique content. This is probably the most exciting uh, change to advertising since the TV. Right, like they, everyone knows that you know Google and Facebook are great platforms to target a micro customer. Right, if you're looking for somebody that lives in Indianapolis, Indiana, in this zip code with this income level, who goes to these sites, you can now get them, and and that's pretty awesome when you think about it. Right, and and, and then the flip side is. As a company, a sports team or whatever, you're targeting them. If you don't like the, the, the people who are viewing your ads and clicking on them, you can make a change the next day, right? Versus with print or with television, you'd have to make the change the next quarter or the next year. It's, it's just, it's super exciting. It's a little bit scary, but it's, it's really exciting for the industry. I mean, the advantage, the advantage is definitely, it's an advantage and a disadvantage that it moves fast and it moves fast. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, I think that's one of the things that we, one of the things we talk about sometimes is what, what content is gonna be the most popular? How, what makes a video go viral? I mean, we had a player that, you know, one year it was like he started doing this Ric Flair thing and it was like all of our traffic came from that and it's like we all sat down as a team thinking, okay, who would have thought that like, this, this one like 30 second clip would be a huge success. And I think as the social platforms, as they really, you know, they were so focused on reach forever, as they start to monetize more and more, I think for, you know, for the NFL, I think our question is, we still are really successful. I mean, in terms of monetizing the traditional model. And so it's sort of our, it's kind of how fast do we shift? I mean, how long do we still invest in that? Because, you know, if you still, you know, we still reach a lot of people on TV and um, something that kind of excites me is as we've gone to the TriCast model and with Amazon, I think, you know, I watched a game on Thursday night on my, through like my Apple TV, you know, you download the Amazon app and or cast it from your phone and um, it's something where live games, people don't, I mean, they'll watch it on their phone, but they would rather watch it. I don't know about you. I'd rather watch it on an 80-inch screen. <laughs> One thing, four inches. Yeah. 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 You know, I've heard, you know, we've all heard the phrase over and over again, content is king. I mean, I believe context is king, right? It's like everyone makes content now. It's how do you use it? You guys did an amazing job of overlay, you know, overlaying content and figuring out how to you know, create the connectivity. And so you know, as, we're, as we're sitting in a game you know, with a client, like, how do we actually take that content that a consumer is gonna, is gonna embrace, and then how do we gingerly weave in purchase messaging? Yeah. <laughs> you know, how do we do that so we're not like, you know, trying to you know, be too overt, but at the same token, they're there, they're interested, they're showing some level of avidity, how do we capitalize on that? So I think the context game is gonna be the next, like the next chapter in this story, because I mean, my kids make content. You know, they're like constantly videotaping, GoProing, you know, YouTubing, you know, Snapchatting. It's how do we how do we actually use that to our advantage? How do we figure out how to put that puzzle together so that consumers will you know embrace it? Yeah, and a little bit. Are you serving the first adopters too much and forgetting, as your point, forgetting about the more traditional fans? Um, so, Carly, you, you have an interesting position. You actually sit on the digital media committee for the NFL, um, but you're also obviously very involved in the Colts' um, digital operations. And, and is, can you talk to us a little bit about what, what the committee's goals are and what the plans are there? And then also, as an owner, is there any tension? How involved do you get in, with your players, with your team versus the league? I mean, because it's very hard. There are probably different point of views all over the place. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it's context specific too. I think you have to, um, I think the question is with the broadcast committee, you know, they negotiate those rights. And then I think as we move forward and make these newer deals and we have, you know, five or six years ago, we wouldn't be like, oh, well, Facebook is, you know, with Facebook Watch and, you know, all the, as these new platforms come into play, I think it, you know, just sort of like in sponsorship, you, it's less about, you know, it used to be, oh, it's really powerful to be exclusive. 
now it's kind of more powerful to like be discovered in many, many places so that, you know, if you're, you know, in Africa and you have a tablet, you can watch a game on a tablet. Or if the time zone's off, it's more like, okay, I don't have to watch this game at two in the morning. If I'm in China, I can watch it when I want to. Um, so I think that's something that it's just sort of a balancing act of keeping pace and evolving, you know, kind of what you were saying, making sure you're not left behind and just stalling out. And, you know, I think because we're sports and we're entertainment, and I think the exciting thing about sports is, like, what makes me excited every day is that, you know, we're, we should be innovating all the time. We should be innovating on the football side. I mean, the way the game has changed over the years, I mean, that's exciting. And, you know, on the, on the business side, too, we should be innovating. And, um, and I think with our players, you know, we've gone through an interesting period where we lost a lot of stars. I mean, our, our club lost, we lost Peyton and Andrew was out. And so, you know, we, we stalled there. But I think the opportunity with social media is we can, without being too intrusive and disruptive, I mean, you can use a little phone as opposed to this giant, you know, guy that comes in with a camera, you know, you can you know, get a testimonial or show fans an inside look. And I think that's just what we keep trying to think of on the club and league level is how do we keep pivoting and, you know, platform keeping it diverse and keeping all the, all the stratas of our fans engaged. It's so smart. And Steve, we talked a little bit earlier about how with all these new digital devices, especially the preference for watching things on mobile, how are you changing how you actually present your actual live game? Yeah, you know, the, the, there's a generation of fans who grew up playing, you know, whether it's the EA NHL game or other leagues games, and we can talk about esports later, but there's a perspective that those games provide. It's that sort of above the ice view, if any of you remember going back to the Sega Genesis days, you know, the above the ice camera where you're following your players zooming up and down the ice. There's a generation of fans who grew up watching, playing that video game. And when they find themselves in sort of a static camera when they're watching broadcasts of hockey going back and forth on a static camera, that's not how they grew up playing the game and seeing the game presented on video games. So, you know, we've, we've worked with our broadcast partners in Canada here in the States as well to try to figure out new ways to incorporate those camera angles into the game to sort of cater to that audience that grew up you know, playing those games and, and seeing hockey presented in that way. The, the All-Star Game in Tampa, we know those, those kind of wire cameras can obstruct views sometimes, and we've got new innovative booms that have been introduced to, to provide that same perspective with less kind of interference in, into the views of the game. But there's also digital disruption happening on the ice itself. You know, we're seeing, we, we have a, a great collaboration with Apple where we've introduced iPads behind the benches. We know our players have grown up using tablets. They've grown up comfortable on mobile devices. They've grown up used to instantaneous feedback. So working with Apple, uh, working with SAP, we've introduced uh, apps on a tablet where players can come off the ice and immediately see highlights and clips of what happens their previous shift, live video. We've got three iPads behind each bench and every club has a video coach cutting those video assets, pumping them onto the iPad, and the coaches and the players are using them in real time to adjust tactics or, or to adjust strategies. You know, our, our officials now use iPads on the, on the ice to review some of the calls that are happening on the ice. So we're seeing technology weave its way into the game on the ice onto the playing surface. We, you know, we've, we've tested in the past putting chips in pucks successfully at the World Cup in, in 2016 with, with ESPN to allow you to track how far, how fast, where the puck is on the ice, ways to track players as well. Um, we've looked at technology that takes the physical dasher board in the arena and the advertisements that are on the physical dasher board and allows you to basically erase those advertisements and insert something digitally to specific feeds and specific broadcasters around the world. So advertising that may be on the boards here in Boston may not be relevant to an audience watching the game in Russia well, we can erase at some level those Dasher advertisements and put in Russian-specific advertising, and we're looking at those technologies as well. So that disruption is happening in the gameplay on the surface as well. So, Greg, you haven't uh, talked about one of the biggest changes as a consumer I've noticed with you guys is you've, your verified fan platform, which is amazing for those of us who get frustrated with scalpers. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? It seems to be incredibly consumer friendly. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, our mantra, I think, as a company is fan identity. 
like, and that, that's to us the holy grail. So if we can figure out ways through programming like verified fan and technology and you know, technology and products like our, our presence product that we're installing into, into venues, and we can actually identify who the fans are and can, you know, we'll, we'll enhance our ability to market to them, talk to them, communicate with them. Uh, I think we'll create a, an incredible benefit on a, on a security standpoint. Um, when you know who's in the building, like on an airplane, if there, if there are security issues in the building to know who's actually in there. Um, and I think the, the third area there is, you know, we'll, we'll help eliminate fraud, fraudulent tickets, which we're seeing all over the place. Verified Fan um, is a brilliant platform that basically, you know, the traditional 50-year-old, 60-year-old going on sale, 100-year-old going on sale for an event and trying to sell all the tickets out and the first 15 minutes and the marker of a good show was, hey, they sold out in five minutes, you know, Taylor Swift sold out in five minutes. The problem within this day and age and on the other side of digital disruption is you've got a lot of nefarious players out there that are building bots that are going to buy all those tickets in the first five minutes and then they're posting them onto the resale market and fans, you know, an artist says, I don't want my ticket to be more than $100 and so you put on $100 and then bots buy them all and then sell them on the secondary market for $1,000. You're actually not serving the consumer, you're certainly not serving the client, because the client has $900 worth of economics they're not taking advantage of. So what Verified Fan does is basically pre-registers fans and scrubs fans to make sure they're actually humans that, that have an affinity for that particular artist. Um, so there's a set of criteria depending on, you know, different, different artists are using different levels of criteria. But, you know, Taylor Swift, we just did a massive program with her where we identified over a million people that were verified human beings that were fans that we knew um, and they wanted tickets. And so when we did our on sale, we did our on sale in waves to those people that we verified. So bots couldn't interrupt that process. So you end up with, you know, not just, not just selling to the right people at the right prices, which is the other factor is like, how do we price effectively? Um, but we know who we're selling to and we can communicate. And we even know who we didn't sell to. So we can go back and counsel Taylor and say, hey, you should play six more shows in these markets because we know you have fans that we've identified and we've verified that didn't get a chance to buy your ticket. So it gives us a chance to have amazing insight and we're protecting the consumer and we're certainly protecting the artist. So it's a different model. Like, you know, some of the media reports came out and said, oh, Taylor Swift's uh, tour is selling slowly. And it wasn't selling slowly, it was selling in waves because we were making sure the tickets were getting into the right hands at the right time. Uh, and I think it's a game changer. It'll change the entire entertainment business when you actually are de dealing with the correct pricing, the, 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 the real people, and you're serving them, and then you have the ability to know who they are and communicate with them forever. You know, now we know you bought, and if you overlay presence into that, and so they enter the building, and we know that person that bought the ticket actually used the ticket, then you have a different level of knowledge and intelligence that you can communicate back to the, the, the client or the customer. Not, not that much different than Starbucks or Apple Music or any of those um, others. So you said before, do you think it's creepy? I think it's the opposite. I was asking. <laughs> no, I think it's the opposite. I think the, the more information that we have and the more specificity that we can talk to customers with, the, the more they, um, you know, people are busy. They don't want to, they don't, they want to, they want to cut to the chase. And so if you, if you know that I'm a New York Knicks fan and that I bought this many tickets and I've gone to the garden this many times and you're serving me offers that are relevant to me or you're talking to me in a way that, hey, there's an act that we know you like coming, you have a chance, you're verified, you have a chance, or you have a, a, a game coming to town that you should go to. I'd much rather cut through that chase and figure out what makes the most sense to me. Like I do on Amazon or like I do on Apple Music or what have you, or Pandora, et cetera. So I, I think we're, we're at, at the start. Fan identity is where we are and what we're trying to create with those products is at the start of a new dawn. You know, it's, 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 it's going to change the business for, forever. Because I think we, we expect discovery. I mean, I think that's how it isn't creepy. You know, like with the Taylor Swift example, I think the you know, my view always used to be like, well, you know, that's my data. Like, why am I not getting something for that and you're taking it? But at the end of the day, if, if sh she looks more like she's doing a service, if yeah. she's, oh, you know, I'm going to do, you know, six more shows because I'm, you know, sold out and some fans missed out. I mean, then it's, then it's a service and it helps her. I mean, I think that's what, you know, the NFL, I think we've, you know, we've had a year of being, you know, of being polarizing and in, 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 
a lot of different ways and being disconnected. And I think the digital, you know, digital disruption can, is an opportunity to create, you know, better connections and better relationships with our fans. Yeah, when I, when I was chief business officer of the Charlotte Bobcats 10 years ago, I, I, I would venture to guess that 90% of my season ticket holders shared their seats, right, with somebody else, because we were so bad. Nobody wanted to invest and go to 41 games on their own. Uh, I don't blame them. Um, we weren't very good. But I only knew the one person who actually purchased the ticket. So if they had three share partners, I didn't know the other three people. And if the other three people invited different people every game, you're talking about probably 100 different people associated with that account. I only knew one person. So when you say service, we couldn't service. We couldn't even service the people that wanted to be there because we didn't know who they were. And I would go around the building, you know, as the, as the mater d' of the game and trying to find people. And it's like, oh, new person. I, I, I've seen them there a couple times. And I'd have to go ask them, like, hey, how'd you get here? Oh, I'm a season ticket holder. Oh, what's your name? You know, and then they're not in the system. So, you know, when you turn around identity and you actually know everyone and you can service them appropriately, it, it's, it's a game changer. And you see that all the time. And, and you know, I, I see it as a... You know, I go shopping on Amazon, and I buy dog food, and then I get offered a dog brush, and it's like, oh, yeah, I should clean my dog once in a while, right? But I wouldn't have thought of that, and I would have had a dirty dog. But um, so anyway, I digress. That's good. Um, so, Fong, we're at a business school so I'd with, a, with a lot of uh, students here. So I'd love to ask, since you have vision into so many different companies, what sets apart the ones who truly innovate, especially digitally, with, with all these opportunities and challenges? Any Sloanies in here? <laughs> with you. I was an 05. <laughs> um, uh, so so let, let me build on that. Let, let me go, because Greg just hit on this phenomenal concept, which, which is presence, right? Like, if you think about, and I'll answer your question, but I was just so excited about this. Like, when you think about mobility, Right, as being number one initially a, a new content delivery platform. Right, you can go somewhere, you're on your phone, you can watch a game, that's awesome. Um, number two, it became a content customization platform where now you could get delivered information to you that was customized to you. Number three, and this is what companies haven't started doing, these are the ones that are going to really innovate, are the ones that are going to take the risk and make it a presence platform. Right, like knowing, so, so if, you go to, if you go to Amazon or you go online, you create an account, okay, so they know how old I am, they, they know my name, they know my address, they know where, you know, they, they, sometimes they, they know all the things that I bought, right? So they're getting a lot of information about me, but not yet do they know where I am at any point in time. And, and once you get to that point where you know where your customers at any point in time, huge creep factor, Huge opportunity, right? And, uh, Delicate balance. Yeah, and, and in the sports world, there's companies that are doing it, right? So there, there's a ticket platform in Europe who, who's, you know, large, large, large platform that's a customer of ours. And they, as an example, you know, were the ticketing platform for the Rio Olympics. And they, they knew, you know, they had, it, they had it as an app on people's phones, and they knew where the, 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 the people going to the Olympics were at any point in time so they could manage queues, and they could move people around, and they could move employees around. They're also the ticketing platform for FC Köln, which is a big soccer club in Germany. And when that, when that club wanted to expand their stadium, they knew not only where the tickets were being bought, where the folks said they were going to sit, they also knew where they were walking around the stadium and knew where to invest in different parts of the stadium. Right? Like, it's sort of creepy, but how cool is that? How cool all of a sudden they can do that? And so the companies, sorry, to, to answer your question, the companies that are going to differentiate are the ones that are going to take these risks. Right? And they're going to go off in different directions. And instead of trying, you know, the, everyone knows the Wayne Gretzky, you know, uh, quote of skate, skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it is. If everybody right now is try, thinking of mobile and digital as, you know, a, a way to deliver content and a way to customize content, everyone's already doing that. You got to do what Ticketmaster is doing and what, you know, all other companies are doing, which is thinking of the next thing. And, and going for it, right? You know, what, knowing what, where a person is in a stadium is a very, very cool and important thing. It's so powerful. And you can't get that any other way than through mobile, which is, which is why mobile is such a cool opportunity right now. And companies that are going to disrupt are the ones that think of mobile as more than what other companies think of it as today. So we are saving a few minutes for questions if you guys want to submit them online. Um, while we see, uh, give you a few minutes to submit your questions, I'm going to do a little bit of a speed round here with these guys. And these are just some topics that 
we hear about in the press a lot. I kind of want to know, what do you think? Are you, are you bullish or bearish, and, and when? And you can be very quick on these, because they're, they're big topics, but I just kind of want to know where your gut and, and your instinct and, and what you've, the data you've seen, what you predict. OTT, OTT sports offerings. When, when do they become a real thing and that people actually consume? I know yeah. a bunch of people are coming out with them. Yeah, I, I think they already are a real thing. I mean, yeah. for, we have NHL.TV that's been around for 10 years, right? So, so OTT, from a out-of-market perspective, has been a real thing for a while, and we're now seeing you know, some of the Amazon with the NFL, and, and the next cycle of big national rights deals are coming up in the next three or four years, I think, for all the sports leagues, and OTT will be a real part of that. You know, we're excited. We have uh, ESPN's first real OTT product, ESPN Plus, and the NHL is a big part of with a, with a big allocation of games into that platform. So I think a lot of people are going to be watching to see how ESPN Plus, as a truly OTT platform for ESPN, as opposed to requiring authentic authentication, is going to play out. But uh, you know, that that's it's real now, and it's and it's just going to continue to get bigger. Yeah, bullish. Bullish. Yeah. Bullish. <laughs> for sure. You know, the 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 digital transformation has made everyone a storyteller, right? So yeah. these platforms just are places to tell your story. And the more, the more that, you know, I, I saw a, a documentary on the plane that landed in the Hudson, and there were tens of thousands of reports of that plane landing on social media before a news outlet got there. So everyone there had become reporters for that moment, right? So. OTT just creates more platforms to basically tell stories, and that's a good thing because people, you know, people who love the NBA or love the NHL, they want to consume as much as they can. So the more the merrier. You guys, I mean, I remember watching the movie Dodgeball when they said ESPN ate the Ocho, and you laughed at it, but you know, ESPN. Is, Eight was years ago. It was years ago. Twenty something now. Um, Esports, and not just for traditional gamers, but how it impacts <laughs> hugely bullish. real sports. Yeah, hugely bullish. You know, I mean, there's 500 million people playing League of Legends on an amateur basis around the world. 500 million. So, you know, it's it's real. It's big. They're figuring out how to, you know, obviously now sell franchises and create competitions and leagues. They're selling out buildings in 10 minutes. You know, they're playing in Madison Square Garden. So, so it's real. It's coming. It's not going anywhere. You know how it how it intersects with traditional sports. I think we're seeing it. We're seeing the NBA and the NHL, and soon the NFL are are, are creating their own leagues and their own teams and their own franchises. So it's 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 a real thing. Yeah, no, it's real. We'll have you'll probably hear something soon, but it's real for us too. <laughs> I think you just broke some news. Nah, it's been broken. It's been broken before. Um, Do you want me to answer? Well, if you yeah, yeah. esports for sure. I think the, the hard part with us is. It's, we, you know, our real game is a bunch, you know, it's these, it's pretty much the best athletes in the world. I mean, no offense to hockey, but it's like the biggest, fastest, strongest people that could probably be Olympians in other sports if they wanted to. And I think the hard part with esports is, you know, the, you know, some of the Overwatch games and the character the way that they're played, it's it's hard to translate into the NFL. I think the, opportun the opportunity that interests me a little bit more is the gamification and how do we kind of, you know, have it be a symbiotic relationship with engaging with um, our live games already. Yeah, it gets people to watch a yeah. too. Smart. Um, virtual reality slash augmented reality. I think yeah, it's, it's, go ahead. Um, VR and AR are awesome. VR and AR plus AI is where it gets really cool, right? Like, you know, putting glasses on and being Michael Jordan, you know, with the Chuck Chicago Bulls is cool. But putting glasses on and them knowing that I'm actually a Carmelo Anthony fan, sorry everybody who isn't, and being, you know, <laughs> playing for the Oklahoma City Thunder and taking a shot in the last three seconds, that's awesome, right? Yeah, AR with the right data overlay is very cool. AR for the sake of AR, maybe not so cool, but if you're able to watch a game and then augment or add on real time what's happening in terms of some of the tracking things we talked about earlier, that's compelling, that's meaningful, that's something people will probably pay for. Other AR is kind of cool, kind of neat, but it's gotta be compelling data, it's gotta be compelling information. VR, the quality just has to get, for live VR to really be a thing, the quality has to continue to improve, and it's improving, but the quality of the actual stream itself needs to continue to improve. I think the, the focus of AR and VR, if, if I were king, I would, I would focus on non, the non-competition content, 
because I think comp like watching competition, watching a Colts game, watching an NHL game, there's still a sense of kind of community and sh like and to be isolated yeah. with your, you know, it's a, it's a little bit different experience because I know when I go to games, whether it's with friends or family, whatever, it's really part of the experience. So kind of isolating yourself, but I think there's a huge opportunity to serve really great content in a different way than before and kind of put you know, put the consumer in a place they've never been to before. And I would, I would start there if I were, if I were kind of Yeah, AR is more social for sure. And you can personalize it. I think that appeals to us, but VR I think is, has a lot more potential as a training tool for players. I mean, it's still in a remedial stages, but I think um, when we think about health and safety and how to train and not wear their body down, I think um, a lot of those, the mental repetitions of game action, I think that part's really interesting. Yeah, I've seen the Stanford players, the, the quarterback trains in a VR, a, re, a VR studio, so he doesn't have to take hits, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Um, so you guys, we are actually out of time, so I apologize we didn't get uh, to the fan questions, um, but thank you guys, you were so uh, verbose and interesting that uh, <laughs> we filled the whole time. Nice job, dude.